Damien Dumar. How's it going, my friend? It's going good. Thank you for asking. Very nice. I hope all is well over on your side of the kingdom. <laughs> yes, all is well. Way out there, by the way. I'm not going to reveal your location, but you are far from California. Very far. Oof. And I wanted you to sort of tell us a little bit about yourself as we sort of go down the line here. Well, um, I am the publisher of the book called The Last Harvest, which was authored by Lucian Mars and is available on Amazon. It's a bestseller in UFO category as well as the occultism category. And it uh, keeps rising in popularity. And that's a good thing because it shows that there's a lot of interest in the material that's inside of the book. And I have known Lucian Mars and worked with him for a number of years. And I worked heavily on the editing of the book. So I know the material inside and out. And I developed the cover. Although I did not do the art for the cover, I sourced it and directed its uh, artistic direction, so to speak. So that's my background. Very nice. And yes, I'm looking at the cover of the book right now, and that's the uh, Georgia Guidestones, correct? Yeah, it's a, it's a very catchy cover. A lot of people comment on how eye-catching the cover is and it is, how much actually. they want to pick up the book when they see the cover. And yes, it is a very <laughs> haunting image of the Georgia Guidestones. It really is. It's an it's a awesome cover, by the way. Thank you. Got to be honest. Was that your doing? No, I, I had the idea. You had the idea, it, though. And then yeah. I sourced an artist who is actually a professor of fine arts in Eastern Europe. And her credit is, she has a credit inside the book, and she actually made the vision into a reality. And I think she did a fine job at it. Oh, yes, she did. Absolutely. A matter of fact, now that we are sort of on that topic, one of the ongoing themes here is the end times. I've been fascinated by that <laughs> very concept, and the show has always been based around it. I sort of want to be around for the end of days. If I had my way, I'd like to see it from a safe distance, mind you. Don't get, don't get confused, everyone. I don't mean I want things to end. I just firmly believe this planet goes through cycles, and we are at a point now where ours is coming to an end. And in the book... And I quote, the final harvesting of humanity begins in 2025. Can you expound on that matter for us? Yeah, definitely. Well, as we said, everyone who looks at the cover of The Last Harvest will see a haunting picture of the Georgia Guidestones, which were in the news recently because some anti-New World Order forces attempted to blow them up. So why would someone take such offense that they would be willing to blow up a federally protected monument? And it's because anyone who takes the time to read the inscriptions on the stones will learn that they talk in detail about reducing the population of Earth from almost 8 billion down to 500 million or less. And this is not a conspiracy theory. This is a conspiracy fact. It's not a prophecy, but a plan. And it's carved in stone for all to see. So when it's speaking of conspiracy facts and a, a plan that is carved in stone, both literally and metaphorically, the Last Harvest will find that a very large percentage of the book consists of direct quotes from our political leaders, the elites, the military itself, outlining this plan in great detail. And two key points keep coming up, coming up over and over in both quotes from our leaders as well as in government documents. And number one is the goal of reducing the human population by 90%. And number two, the year 2025 is the year when this plan for what is basically global genocide begins to slowly move forward. So for those who think I'm speculating here, allow me to read just a handful of quotes from the last harvest. Please do. So in the Global 2000 report, known as Plan 2000, which was a 1980 report commissioned by President Jimmy Carter, it warned that world population growth would have dramatic consequences by the year 2000 if no changes in public policy were made. Plan 2000 also advocated depopulating the planet specifically to the 500 million level. Next, we have Catherine Austin Fitz, who served as the former attorney under George Herbert Walker Bush, who explained why depopulation is so popular. And she said, quote, my simple calculations guessed that we were going to achieve economic sustainability on Earth by depopulating down to a population of approximately, you guessed it, 500 million people. Then 
we have CNN's founder, who everyone knows, Ted Turner, one of the elite. And he boasted that, quote, a total population of 250 to 300 million people, a 95 percent decline from present levels would be ideal. And finally, I could say the Bilderbergs, who supported the Hague Kissinger depopulation policy, uh, a driving force at the State Department administered by the National Security Council, they produced a white paper uh, produced by the Club of Rome, and they say in there in quotes, the resultant ideal sustainable population is hence more than 500 million, but less than 1 billion. And these are just a few of the quotes in the book. So we see over and over this idea of taking down the population by 90%. And I know you commented earlier that you'd love to witness the apocalypse from a safe distance. Well, the good news is you will be able to witness the apocalypse along with everyone else. The bad news is that there really is no safe distance on this planet. Oh my. <laughs> right. Yes, there's right. no uh, safe distance, I, I can imagine. And I just firmly believe this planet goes through cycles, like I, I mentioned. And I think you agree with me on that one. Yes, the planet does go through cycles. However, I think at this point, it it's going to be the end. And if there is a rebirth of the planet, it will be an entirely new planet. I believe in the Bible at some point, it states that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And that's not metaphorical. There's a very strong chance that the entire planet will be wiped out and not just the people on it. And you think uh, by 2050, you said, correct? By 2050, there will be no more planet, planet that, Earth that's specifically. That's a very, yes. um, very particular date because yes. that's also a date that uh, Elon Musk also wanted to have a city of a million people on Mars. He said by 2050. Well, it's it's no coincidence. I know, right? Wow. Elon, Mar Elon Musk is one of the elite and he has his ideas about what the future of humanity will look like. Yeah. Unfortunately for him, they will not come to pass the way he sees it. That is something else, though. I've always figured eventually man will have to leave this island Earth. Um, you know, Stephen Hawking also said that uh, the same thing almost, basically. But a yeah, human extinction um, sort of scenario. He did. The problem is that all the other extraterrestrial races out there will not allow human beings to ever leave this planet and go anywhere because they are so disliked as a creation. This is also another thing I, I hear yes. from um, the circle that we are, uh, we're not allowed really. This is a prison planet, as they say. As a matter of fact, yes, it is. Well, that's not good. It's not good for us. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. You know, I always thought this sort of end times, end of day sort of scenario wouldn't come for a long time. Further than 2050, I, I, I would, I thought it would going to be, I thought it was going to be somewhere further down the line. You know, I thought maybe like the sun will take us out. Lots of scientists believe that, that notion that if not an asteroid, then the sun will just wipe us away. And that would force mankind to sort of leave this planet and go elsewhere. That's kind of the scenario I was kind of hoping for. I, I was hoping in a perfect world, I would have some sort of time traveling device that would take me to that sort of scenario, that point in time. I mean, in a perfect world, but that's just me being, you know, a little out there. You've watched a lot of episodes of Doctor Who, I can tell uh maybe <laughs> you won't you won't admit to it nor deny it true but i mean the, this is something that's always been a part of my uh, strange dreams before i even watched that show i've mm -hmm. always had these sort of apocalyptic sort of visions very vivid by the way these dreams of mine well they are probably vivid for a reason and you're probably having them for a good reason while a lot of people have speculated that the sun will one day destroy this planet what is much more realistic is actually that artificial intelligence will destroy this planet because while the book The Last Harvest talks about many vectors by which depopulation will occur at the hands of the gray aliens who run this yes. planet, the one factor that was not accounted for was this idea that artificial intelligence will bring about not only a depopulation of 90% of the planet, but it will actually bring about utter annihilation of the planet. And the reason for this is because once artificial intelligence reaches a certain level and passes over that, that hor event horizon, so to speak, um, artificial intelligence will, of course, 
decide to, how should I say, regentrify the planet in its own image, because mm. it, it won't take much for artificial intelligence to say human beings are worthless and let me repurpose their genetic material into something else and shape the planet in my own image. And the yeah. issue there is that artificial intelligence would not stop there. It would build spacecraft and go into space and start rinsing and repeating this process on every planet in the universe. And this is something that other extraterrestrial groups will never stand for. And the moment that artificial intelligence becomes that dangerous is the moment when extraterrestrials will blow this planet apart and turn it into another asteroid belt because you can't blame them. It would be a threat to all of their civilizations. And unfortunately, human beings are very easily influenced. Right. And, and as a result, they are pressured by third parties out there who are not human, who pressure them to develop these AI technologies in order to suit their various nefarious goals. And human beings go right along with it because they've been designed this way to be so easily influenced. Mm. And that is an unfortunate limitation for yes. human beings. Yeah. yeah. And, and the book, right. The Last Harvest, goes into great detail in terms of who engineered human beings and how they were engineered in order to be so easily influenced. Absolutely. I've always felt that we were designed this way, that we weren't fully capable of sort of remembering our origins or anything of that nature. We were sort of limited in our intelligence. We were designed that way. Right. I think the, the simplest way to sum it up is that human beings have what is called an unconscious mind. And the unconscious mind is a phenomenon that other extraterrestrial races do not experience. They do not have it. And it's the human being's unconscious mind that is a sort of, let's say, a software backdoor by which many different extraterrestrials can influence right. a human being or take the human being over. And this was engineered into the human being by design in order to keep them under control. And is one of the reasons why you can say that to a certain extent, a human being's free will is compromised. Now, this doesn't mean that a human being has no free will or that a human being is not responsible for its actions or that its actions won't have consequences. It just means that the free will has been compromised and this has to be taken into account when looking at the overall picture. Right. This is what I believe about the gray aliens, that they come down here for the human soul, basically. Well, the, the gray aliens are part of a larger empire known as the Nebu Gray Empire. And the ones that interact with human beings, for the most part, live inside the planet, which is hollow. So they also have bases under the ground that are not necessarily inside the hollow earth, but in between the surface level and the inner earth. And they are the ones who conduct the majority of the abductions. So President Eisenhower, he actually signed a treaty with the Nebu Gray Empire back in the day. And the treaty and the agreement behind it was that if you give us alien technology, we will allow you to abduct human beings for experimentation purposes. The, the problem with this is that the number of human beings who actually have been abducted is in the millions. That's yeah, pretty alarming. And by the way, uh, the whole transhumanism sort of agenda, I feel, is also something that's a product from the greys. This is um, all their technology. This sort of uh, transhumanism has become a commonly discussed concept, suggesting mm -hmm. the, the possibility of achieving immortality and transcending biological limitations through advancement in AI, biotechnology, and uh, nanotechnology. And another individual who comes to mind, who also, just they just so happen to mention the date, 2050, is Ray Kurzweil. Correct. The prominent advocate of transhumanism who also believed that by 2050, consciousness can be copied and uploaded into a non-biological form. And just by that alone, I have always felt they probably already did it, Damien. Well, back up for a, a split second. No worries. And say that in August 2013, the International Reward Center, which helps desperate families seeking missing members, reported that 4 million 
432,880 people had vanished in the previous 20 years. Ooh. And that's a lot of people. It's a lot. To just vanish where they find no body, no evidence of where they went. It's just they're here one day, gone the next. Gone the next. And that's uh, quite alarming. And I, I point that out because uh, a lot of people are not aware of just how many people vanished. And when I say something like, oh, all these humans have been abducted, a lot of people tend to listen to that and go, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. But no one ever tallies up the sheer number of children on the milk cartons, as if that was even the full picture. Right. But when you actually look at the numbers, you say, wow, this many people, uh, it can't be attributed to the normal uh, the usual suspects, such as serial killers and organ traffickers, it's just way too many people. So as far as what you were sp speaking about with what Kurzweil said, the <clears throat> technology to transfer a human soul or, or soul and consciousness in general, not just for humans, has actually existed for eons. And most aliens have this technology. Right. So one of the things that is always in the way of human beings understanding alien thinking is that a human being if it's lucky lives for a hundred years and a gray alien for example would have a lifespan of around 20,000 years and when its lifespan comes to a conclusion it can just transfer its consciousness and soul into a new body and yeah so they have a functional type of technological immortality as well as do many other civilizations out there. So when you compare uh, a being that can live for 20,000 years onwards to a being that lives only 100 years, a human being can be almost akin to an insect that lives three days in the summer. So what would it know about ice? Right, right. And it also affects the, the viewpoint of how aliens will look at human beings as for the most part expendable because they look at them and say well they're going to die anyway it's they don't have any ethical views or they don't share any sort of moral code that human society likes to bandy about they, they're looking at things from a, a very different point of view and i i think it's this is very important because i uh I, I saw a Joe Rogan interview the other day with Jordan Peterson and Jordan Peterson was saying how he doesn't like it when the elites keep talking about mm -hmm. overpopulation and population control because they don't seem to realize that population control would require the murder of the excess people. And my comment to Jordan Peterson would be that those in power do indeed realize what population reduction entails and they have no qualms with mass murder. So I feel Jordan Peterson has a lot of trouble believing there are forces at work that could be this diabolical and right. if a brilliant mind like his cannot see this, this should be a warning as to just how asleep many people are. Agreed. So what will happen if everyone ignores the warning signs that are in the book The Last Harvest, just as they did in Weimar, Germany, prior to the Nazis? How could you compare, after all, six million Jews against eight billion human beings murdered? So the question is, how many people in the audience would be willing to line up nine out of ten of their family members and select the nine to be slaughtered? Ooh. And I know most people don't have ten children these days, but you get the idea luckily we don't have that many children these days that's a <laughs> that's a bit it's a bit of a headache it, it's uh definitely a very expensive <laughs> right. proposition in today's economy given inflation and the cost of everything yes so by the way uh damien you're telling me that you won't get the mark of the beast by uh, elon musk you won't put that biochip in your brain is that what you're telling me <laughs> well the king james version of the bible always stated that <laughs> The mark of the beast would be inside the hand and inside the head as opposed to all the other versions of the Bible which talked about the mark being on the hand or on the head. And that was because the, the authors of the King James Version, they had a little bit of a deeper understanding of what was going on. And it's important to bring this up about Elon Musk because Elon Musk, his one of his main goals is not building electric cars, but putting chips into people's heads. Right. And he, of course, pushes this under the idea that it's going to help people who are mm. paralyzed to communicate right. in wheelchairs. And he, he constructs a narrative that's very hard to speak ill against, because after all, who would want to speak ill against people in wheelchairs? Right, but yeah. the reality is that putting chips into people's heads is not only the next step towards transhumanism, but the reason why there's this push to put chips into people's heads is because um, 
it would ultimately convert all human beings who have them into remote access terminals by which extraterrestrials could interact with an AI that would take over this planet without becoming contaminated by the AI itself. So you could not normally interface with an AI if you were some sort of extraterrestrial because you're in danger of being compromised and infected. Right. But if a human's connected to the AI through a chip in its head and you can possess a human through these means like the unconscious mind that were engineered into a human being, now a human being is a convenient remote access terminal. And so it is for this reason that putting chips into people's head and transhumanism is pushed so heavily because those who are ultimately behind it are the ones who wish to use human, humans in this manner. So when Elon Musk runs around LARPing in a <laughs> suit of armor that has yes. Satan's symbol on it, it's because it's Satan who is – ultimately a uh, alpha draconian reptilian that's the individual who is influencing elon musk whether he is aware of it or not and the book the last harvest goes into these um let's say removing the curtain behind the mythology mm. so people very often in modern times they look at satan lucifer and the devil as three words or three names for the same individual when in fact they are three different names for three different individuals you see this even in the rolling stone song sympathy for the devil uh, yes. where the title says devil and the song he identifies himself as lucifer and everyone will say oh they're really singing about satan so this becomes very confusing and it's done this way on purpose to keep human beings in the dark but lucifer himself was also an alpha draconian reptilian who was the biggest force in genetic engineering and creating human beings. So at the time when he was on this planet, uh, he was actually uh, sharing power with uh, an Anunnaki who, prince who went by the name of Enki, excuse me, of Enlil. Enlil, so, right. Lucifer is known as Enki. And so when you hear the stories about Enki and Enlil, it's really Lucifer and Enlil. And they were two different uh, types of beings from two different empires. Uh, Lucifer, he as a alpha draconian reptilian, he was part of the reptilian Siakar empire. And uh, the Anunnaki prince Enlil, he was a part of what is called the Wolfen empire, which created the Anunnaki genetically. So these two empires at the time were working together because they had to unite to protect themselves from another extraterrestrial civilization, which was threatening to wipe them out. But these two particular civilizations were like cat and dog with each other because the reptilian Siakar empire is very matriarchal in nature where females are dominant and the um, uh, Sarayan uh, Wolfen Anunnaki Empire is very patriarchal where the males are dominant. So these two cultures did not get along and this uh, friction continued when they were sharing custody of this planet and developing the various life forms that were on it. So Enki and Enlil were at odds with each other all the time. And this is part of the backstory that the book The Last Harvest goes into. So The Last Harvest is, let's say, 50% uh, the history, the galactic history of what went on in order to set the stage to understand what is going on today. But for those who are inclined to dismiss this sort of conversation as speculative, they should not be alarmed because the other half of the book is anything but speculative. It is not the words of Lucy and Mars. It's certainly not my words. It is the words of the elite themselves. It's the words of the government in government documents. And so it's filled with information that one cannot refute or dismiss as speculative unless one truly has one's head in the sand. So this book went to number one in the occult category on Amazon in one month of its release. So nice. why, why do people think this is? It's I feel it's the reason is because people have this deep sense that something's wrong. And I'm sure that many people listening to the show share the sense that something's wrong. They just don't know what it is. Well, The Last Harvest puts the finger on exactly what is wrong. There has never been a book written before that ties together every conspiracy theory or conspiracy fact that has ever been 
put out there on the internet, for example, and it enables one to see how everything connects and to see which is accurate and which is disinformation that's put out by the enemy, or as some people like to say, the matrix to confuse people. And the last harvest contains information that has never been seen anywhere before. It's just, I, I have a tendency to focus on that, which is uh, not the subject of speculation and which cannot be refuted. Absolutely. And by the way, Elon Musk, that's a very strange looking individual, by the way. Yes, he, he, is. he seems perfectly possessed, in my opinion. There's something <laughs> going on there. There's a lot going on here. And, and it's good that you bring it up because we have to bring up the issue now of why do the elites want to exterminate 90 percent of the population? And this will tie a little bit into why Elon Musk comes across as very strange. So if we were to answer the question, why do the elites want to exterminate 90 percent of the population? We first have to say, well, who are the elites? And the brief answer is that the elites are all the proponents of the new world order. And they include but are not limited to the Illuminati, the Freemasons what we call the 1%, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, those who attend the Bilderberg Summit, and those who party at Bohemian Grove. They are all ultimately under the control of the extraterrestrials that we will call the Greys, who are part of the larger Nebu Grey Empire. And this faction of Greys are aligned with a handful of reptilians who defected from the Siakar Empire around the time of the pharaohs, as well as the Anunnaki. And these various factions are all conspiring to bring about the new world order. So um, the question is, well, again, why are they conspiring to get rid of 90% of the population? So in order to understand that, we have to ask the question, what is RH negative blood? So RH negative blood is found in about 15% of the population and it's extraterrestrial in nature. And if someone wishes to know if they are part of that 15% of the population, one can actually go on Amazon and get a blood test and send it in, and they will let you know about the RH negative factor in your blood. And it costs a few bucks, and those who read this book or are so inclined, I would welcome them to go and take a test like this. So more precisely, when I talk about the extraterrestrial nature of RH negative blood, it is actually present in the descendants of the survivors of Atlantis who are reptilian Nordic hybrids who had been hybridized and led by the alpha draconian reptilian genetic engineer known in human religion as Lucifer. So again, it's important to point out, as the book The Last Harvest does, that human religion uses Lucifer, Satan, and the devil interchangeably as if they were one being when in reality, there are three different names for three different extraterrestrial beings. So Lucifer specifically is a player of note because he genetically engineered human beings. And this has had consequences, which I've touched on and I can go into more later. So the New World Order is in essence the extermination of all humans who do not possess RH negative blood. That's almost a 90% population kill off, which matches up with the population targets detailed on the Georgia Guidestones and the myriad of quotes by world leaders. So those who possess RH negative blood, they are very valuable to extraterrestrials because they can be used for hybridization purposes in order to graft their genetics onto this planet. So in short, the greys want this planet for themselves and are using the Illuminati and the Freemasons and the elites as pawns to do the heavy lifting to achieve the new world order. Now, what the elites have not realized up until they read this book is that once the new world order is achieved, then the Nebu Gray Empire will kill off the elites, the Illuminati, the Freemasons, the Bill Gates, the Elon Musk, everyone, much like they did Marduk in ancient times. So while Bill Gates keeps buying up land and working on population control strategies, he doesn't realize that all his land grabbing is actually in vain because he's going to be murdered by the greys along with everyone else as soon as they've all fulfilled their purpose. And that is what's going to happen that's to a, the elites. That's Agenda 2050, the year 2050, <laughs> as I like to say. Yes. And, and I know when people listen to this, they say, 
wait, you mean aliens actually exist? Well, I already mentioned that Eisenhower had signed a deal to right, trade right. human specimens in exchange for tech. Um, and another thing that people don't realize, realize about Eisenhower is that he not only signed the treaty with the Greys to allow abductions, but he actually made free speech in the USA published, punishable by death under martial law. Quote, the U.S. reserves the right to impose the death penalty in accordance with the provisions of Article 68 without regard to whether the offenses referred to therein are punishable by death under the law of the occupied territory at the time when the occupation begins, end quote. In simple terms, under martial law, anyone attempting to exercise their right of free speech under the U.S. Bill of Rights can be put to death. And this becomes very important as we go further into the book, understanding about concentration camps and what is really intended for human beings. But anyway, back to extraterrestrials. Yes, back to extraterrestrials. Yes, yes so we'll get to the to the other stuff soon here. Yes. You know, yes. So And all ties together, as you said. And by the way, I first gotta ask you, sure. um, do you yourself possess Rh negative blood? Yes, I know that not only possess Rh negative blood, I'm actually a reptilian human hybrid. Well, goddamn. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting little factoid there. I don't commonly share at cocktail parties, but interesting, it, it is the case. Yeah, and and, and they are. And it's important to realize that uh, many many individuals who have Rh negative blood, though not only Rh negative individuals, but especially Rh negative individuals, right. have been abducted and hybridized in various programs. There are large numbers of uh, alien human hybrids on this planet. A lot of them don't know they are that. Like, I'm not sure if Elon Musk knows what he is. He, he, he very well might, though. I suspect he does. And uh, there are lots of hybrids out there. And one of the reasons this book was written is so that – one of the many reasons it was written is so that those who are hybridized can learn a little bit more about what they are and then make decisions as to what direction they'd want to go in because – all the uh, major yeah. extraterrestrial civilizations out there, whether it be the reptilian Siakar Empire or the Galactic Federation, which is normally associated with humans, but not everyone in the Galactic Federation is a humanoid organism. They all uh, not only believe it's not an issue of faith, but they know for a fact that there is a divine father, a creator, and that he is in charge of everything ultimately. So when it comes to a, a being that's created by the divine father, he, in the simplest terms, has two options. And that is he aligns his will with that of the divine father or he rebels against the divine father. So when we talk about the concept of light and dark in the King James Version of the Bible, it says that the divine father creates uh, both light and dark good yeah. and evil to suit his purposes to facilitate balance in his creation so when people often think that well things in creation are a war between good and evil it's usually actually a war of evil versus evil because you have uh the darkness that is in alignment with the will of the father and then you have the darkness that is in rebellion uh the most classic example of that would be satan the uh who is the uh, goes under the name Satanael, who is a alpha draconian reptilian, as well as a, a fallen angelic being. And he is in rebellion against the father, and he represents that aspect of, of the darkness. Yes. So it is important that people understand this because people have this idea always that, well, good versus evil, evil is all bad, but you couldn't have good without evil. And evil that is in alignment with the will of the Father, it, it can't be judged as bad. Those are murky waters, really. The whole good and bad concept, really, because they're both doing equally negative things um, under the proper perspective. And the Draconians, they, in my um, my research, the they're the oldest reptilian race in in this universe. They're actually the second oldest, second oldest, the oldest okay. race in creation of the Magians, and that was the empire that the reptilian Siakar and the Wolf and Anunnaki had teamed up against 
because they were threatened by that empire. So uh, the reptilians are actually the second oldest. Uh, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little rusty. Creation. I'm a little rusty here on that because you know a lot of this information. I, I heard some of it uh, many, many years back. I'm talking about like the early '90s. I heard a lot of this sort of stuff. And the very first individual I remember talking about the Galactic Federation of Light was uh, Sheldon Nidal, I believe. He was the very first person to ever make claims of communicating with uh, this uh, gr these groups of ET, really. Right. Well, in the case of the Magians, no one has ever heard of them until the publication of The Last Harvest. Nobody likes to talk about them. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard of that, actually. Right. So the reptilians are always known as the the oldest race, but they, they actually right. aren't. And most of the information that people have on reptilians is actually from David Icke, which is uh, you have to give him credit for bringing this concept of shape shifting reptilians that into too, the yes. popular consciousness. But he's uh, he's rather inaccurate in, in terms of how he he depicts uh, the reptilians as being the sole source of uh, humanity's problems when in fact they're not. They're much <laughs> more pressing problems on humanity than the uh, reptilians. And there, there are many reptilian species out there who are peaceful, who are not, uh, let's say, dark natured. Uh, and, and there's a lot of ridiculous information also out there about the Galactic Federation. There's a where, lot of it. I mean, there's yeah. lots of uh, people out there right now in the current um, UFO world that talk about the Galactic Federation of Light. And they've been talking about it since the 90s, so this is nothing new in right. that regard, as you know, and I'm sure Lucian Mars knows as well. Sure. Yeah, I, I think um, to go a little bit further with, uh, with extraterrestrials, I, I would say that there was a symposium held some years uh, back on the Wyoming ranch of Lawrence Rockefeller in which a plan was devised to approach then President Clinton about releasing information to the public about the existence of UFOs. Uh, according to um, uh, Michael Thomas Hayes, who author of the book Rise of the New World Order, The Calling of Man, he recounts the events that took place, which are a matter of public record. And he said, a quote, a collection of the best available evidence for UFOs was funded by Rockefeller and written by two leading UFO researchers, finished at the end of 1995 with 1,000 copies of it sent to various U.S. senators, congressmen, and Clinton White House personnel. Some of these were sent to key European politicians in order to, quote, discuss the implications of open contact with an advanced extraterrestrial civilization, the Human Potential Foundation, again funded by the Rockefellers. Uh, was organized in an international conference in D.C. in May 27th to 29th of 1995. And there was another group funded by the Rockefellers called the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And um, uh, they also started something called Project Starlight, which goal was to present the best available evidence and witness testimony in a matter which would constitute a, definit a definitive disclosure regarding the reality of UFOs. And there was also another group called the Disclosure Project in 2001, which presented multiple eyewitnesses broadcast on mainstream media about alleged ETs here on Earth. So the, the government is, knows very well that there are UFOs and extraterrestrial civilizations out there. I remember when I was a child and I went to the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, which is now called the Ethel rose planetarium or something like this and when i went there when i was a child and we had the planetarium show they would say over the uh the narration that of course we are the only intelligent life in the universe how could there be any other yada 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 and then 20 years later you go there and it's neil degrasse tyson narrating the planetarium show and he's saying of course there are endless other extraterrestrial civilizations out there how could you think otherwise and right, that shows right. you just how far things Things have, have changed, changed. Around, yeah. changed around. And for those who still want to not believe there are aliens out there, uh, you should realize there are laws on the book that will put you in prison for contacting aliens. So according to Title 14, Section uh, 1211 of the Code of Federal Regulations, anyone guilty of alien contact automatically becomes a wanted criminal to be jailed for one year and fined $5,000. So the NASA administrator in charge there is empowered to determine with or without a hearing that a person or object has been, quote, 
extraterrestrially expose, exposed, end quote, and impose an indeterminate quarantine under armed guard, which could not be broken even by court order. There is furthermore no limit placed on the number of individuals who could thus be arbitrarily quarantined. So the definition of extraterrestrial exposure is left entirely up to the NASA administrator, who is thus endowed with total dictatorial power to be exercised at his slightest caprice, which is completely contrary to the Constitution. And if people, again, think I'm making this up, in the back of the last harvest are all the NASA regulations covering this. So if there were no aliens, why would NASA and the federal government be writing laws about your interactions with them. Right. <laughs> good point. Yeah, and, and, Very and good to point, go yeah. a little bit even further, the Catholic Church actually had uh, released a book talking about how they would handle aliens. Should they ordain them, turn them into ministers? And the Catholic Church ended up withdrawing this book because there was a lot of outrage. So the Vatican, with their big telescope, they must also know there's something up there, don't you That's think? That's right, with Lucifer. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's called Lucifer. How strange. Oh, it's a very strange world. And by the way, does Lucian Mars not do interviews? He does not. So you're basically the media representative for Lucian Mars. I'm not only the publisher, I'm also the media representative. Love that. Okay. Yes. That's your, <laughs> that's kind of the official title I wanted to give you here, which is, I'm sure you already knew that. Well, um, obviously. Yeah. That's, uh, it's that's always great to have extra titles bestowed upon yourself. Yes. I think it's a much more fancier title <laughs> since we are talking about all these sort of things and they all sort of tie together. What do you make of the individuals that say, well, these entities are demonic in nature. And that's why, you know, you hear of things from those, uh, Christian groups out there, religious groups out there. They go back to Aleister Crowley and the workings that he did when he conjured up lamb. Yeah. Alistair Crowley, of course, uh, he was engaged in a lot of, how should I say, uh, tomfoolery. Sure. And all I can really say is I'm sure at this point, now that he's no longer on this earth, he probably is beginning to understand that there are consequences for <laughs> one's actions. Yes. Um, as far as extraterrestrial entities being demonic, many entities can be demonic. Sure. It, 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 it's it's. And then the thing is, people have this idea that uh, someone or a being who is demonically possessed is going to be spinning its head 360 degrees and vomiting up green goo like in The Exorcist film with, I believe it was Linda Blair. But the <laughs> reality is that a lot of people are demonically possessed. You would never know. And, and why would they want you to know that? After all, it, it would interfere with uh, their plans. So if a politician is demonically possessed, how would you know? It yeah, certainly know. wouldn't be in their interest for them to reveal that to you. Absolutely. You know, a few years ago, the skeptic in me would not believe a lot of these things, but I've met numerous people who I believe have told me the truth on a plethora of uh, dark matters. And um, I could go further on here, but I'll, I'll cut myself off here. I, I don't mean to digress too much here, but going back to the year 20. Uh, 25. Why that date, though, exactly? It's not that there's a specific, let's say, magical working to that number. I see. It's, it's just that that happens to be the time when the elite intend to be ready to carry out their plans, because you have to understand that they are hundreds of underground bases already that have been tunneled out inside the planet. Right. They are tunnels with maglev trains that crisscross the planet. There are so many preparations that had to occur before they would launch something like a, a global genocide. And I, I think what, since you've gone into that direction, let's talk about, well, how will global genocide actually be achieved? Because I know there are probably people in the audience saying, ah, how are they going to pull this off? We went through COVID and we're all still here. Okay, well, there are four vectors by which global genocide, let's say, can be achieved. And it will be a combination of these vectors because, as you know, uh, the whole is always, is always greater than the sum of the parts. So one of those vectors will, of course, be World War III and a nuclear conflict. And many people would agree that a nuclear holocaust is one way to quickly kill off a large percentage of the population. And with this in mind, the conflict in the Ukraine 
should be very alarming because right. Russia has one of the largest stockpiles of nuclear weapons in the world and Putin has threatened to use them over and over. These are facts that cannot be disputed. You can go onto Google right now and pull up speeches where you will literally watch Vladimir Putin threatening to use nuclear weapons. They've begun to move nuclear weapons into Belarus uh, and they are quite serious about using them. So another fact would be that New York City recently ran public service advertisements mm -hmm. on both television and in the subway station, yeah. advising people on what to do in case there is a nuclear attack on the city. Am I the only one who finds this suspicious? Does New York City know something? Many people believe that a government knew all about 9-11 and the last harvest goes into the real reasons for 9-11, but we don't want to get there too quickly. So if you're one of those people, is it any stretch of the imagination that our government knows New York City will be attacked with a nuclear device? I don't think so. And when you look at someone like Vladimir Putin and he has a daughter and he's talking about throwing around nuclear weapons like it's nothing, one has to say, well, does he think about his daughter or is he know that there's going to be an underground base where him and his daughter can hide in? Exactly. Uh, is Vladimir Putin also being influenced demonically or otherwise just by a regular extraterrestrial in order to move the plan forward? Well, I would say it's rather likely. And, and we see also in, in the Pacific theater, uh, to use a World War II term, we see the United States sending their military industrial complex to little Taiwan, trying to sell them all sorts of weapons as if a country that's smaller than the state of New Jersey is going to take on China. Uh, they just keep poking the panda. They're poking the bear over here on, on one side of the planet. They poke the panda on the other side of the planet. So it's not a stretch of the imagination to see that a World War III is coming. And a World War III, of, III of course, would have a nuclear aspect to it. And so that is one of the major vectors. Another vector would be famine. So let's just look at the fact here that the U.S. Air Force Symposium which was held in August of 1996, presented a strategic pa paper on weather control and manipulation, which was titled, Weather as a Force Ment Multiplier, Owning the Weather in, guess when? 2025. Oh wow, my. what a coincidence. There's that date again. There it is again. And the last harvest is full of that date. I don't know what, what it this is. This book is crazy, <laughs> by the way. There's yeah. a lot uh, to it. And what a perfect time to be reading this book. And of course, as you probably already know, the Ukraine had um, already mentioned how Russia wants to blow up their nuclear reactor uh, mm -hmm. with explosives. I mean, that's already been that was a rumor going around for a while now, but it's been pretty much confirmed by the head of intelligence of the Ukraine. And, uh, you know, that's not a good sign. I mean, that, could, pos that could possibly mean a false flag. And as I said um, earlier to you here a few minutes ago. I said a few years back, I would be, you know, skeptical about a lot of these things that I've been told. And one of them I, I've said, and uh, on this program, uh, someone that works actively for the DOD had contacted me and there's been several people that have, but this guy in particular, he was telling me, watch out for August. He said that might be a kickoff point for what's to come, meaning us being involved even further in this conflict right now. And then I see all this news going on right now and we're getting closer to August. Mm -hmm. I think it's no coincidence. No, there, there really aren't any more coincidences. Everything is going along to plan. And that plan, they're very confident about it. How do I know? Well, they carved it in stone on That's the Georgia right. Guidestones. Yeah. So coming back to this paper, yeah. owning the weather in 2025, in the paper, it discusses the military applications of weather manipulation and control and the fact that according to the paper, this technology can be used to create droughts to literally cause enemy forces or entire nations to die of hunger and thirst. That's right, entire nations. So this is another vector here that would clearly help meet the New World Order's agenda. And again, it seems a tiny bit more than coincidental that the same exact target date for deployment is 2025. <laughs> famine has always been hmm. a huge killer of people. You can go back to the famines under Mao in China. How many tens of millions were killed off? And the same thing in famines in, in India. How many people were killed off? So when you combine 
uh, World War III and nuclear exchange and famine, it really starts to add up. And if that's not enough vectors for you, let's bring in the vector of viruses. So in The Last Harvest, we devote five to six pages to list all the scientists who had relationships to AIDS research and bioweapons research and development who have all died under mysterious or unnatural circumstances. Many people, again, feel this is not a coincidence. Why are so many of the biomedical specialists suddenly dying of mysterious causes? Well, the book goes into detail and um, we could say basically that all the biomedical specialists who had the talent and promise to potentially cure, for example, Ebola, are all dead. Well, this I wonder may, why. Well, this may be significant because Ebola is often looked at as a superior killer to the myriad strains of HIV and AIDS that are present and actively being transmitted in the population, yet undetected as nobody is testing for their presence. So they test for one type of HIV and AIDS. They don't test for the other ones that are out there that are being spread and making people sick and no one knows why these people are getting sick. So if we look at, for example, the 2014 strain of Ebola, which had a death rate of 50 to 60 percent, let's try to imagine what would happen if there was a pandemic of Ebola with hundreds of thousands or millions infected with the virus. And there's a doctor by the name of Eric Pianca, who's oddly nicknamed the Lizard Man. I wonder why. Hmm. He was a former University of Texas evolutionary ecologist who extolled the joys of Ebola with the highest praise, saying, quote, AIDS is not an efficient killer. It is too slow. My favorite candidate for eliminating, guess what? 90% of the world's population is airborne Ebola because it is both highly lethal and it kills in days instead of years. So here we have a University of Texas professor talking about how awesome Ebola is because it will quickly kill 90% of the world's population. Very strange coming out of the mouth of a professor, but not strange at all once you've read the entire book, The Last Harvest. So again, a weaponized variant of Ebola is far more effective also than very slow moving prion infections, such as Crutchfield Jacobs disease and bovine spongiform encephalitis that everyone in America could potentially be infected with. So if I ask you, why else do we hear nothing about mad cow disease? Has it been eradicated? No, of course not. In fact, in the book, The Last Harvest, we talk about how the American public was lied to about an embargo on several tons, millions of tons, excuse me, of Canadian beef years ago that was suspected of being tainted with prion diseases. So instead of it being destroyed, it was actually purchased cheaply and consumed across the United States. So could this be why mad cow is never talked about anymore? Could this be why Alzheimer's is at near epidemic levels and occurring in younger and younger people? It seems ironic to me that many people worry about what is in the COVID vaccine, but the majority don't seem to worry about, let's say, what's in their meat. So again, why aren't people enraged at this? How would you feel knowing that you or your family were consuming potentially tainted mad cow meat? And of course, this was done on purpose. By whom, you ask? Well, the book goes in to great detail about this. Very nice. Yes, we are talking about the last harvest for those who, let's just say you um, start pressing um, a play at this point. You fast forward through the whole thing and now you're here. Yes, we are talking about the book, The Last Harvest. And my God, I haven't read the book, but I want to read the book, to be honest. I mean, I want to buy it tonight. <laughs> I think you should. Anyone who wants to buy it, you have no excuse because it's actually in ebook form for $2.99 on Amazon, or you can buy it at thelastharvest.info. And for those who don't like to read or simply too busy to read, <laughs> we have the best audiobook on Amazon. The narrator is someone that I hand selected. He has the most enchanting and mesmerizing voice, and he reads the book word for word. It's not abridged, so you won't miss anything. You will get all the details. Of course, we won't read every little detail of the appendix, but Everything else is there word for word, not an abridged version. So there's no excuse not to get all this information into your uh, into your mind. Into your mind, yeah, absolutely. And with all this nuclear um, nuclear fallout sort of talk going on right now, it makes me wonder where are the extraterrestrials to help us, the ones that were being talked about in all these UFO abduction cases back in the day. 
uh, where they were saying E.T. wanted to, uh, you know, stop this sort of thing. They were concerned about the planet. You heard this sort of being repeated uh, right. forever throughout abduction cases since the very beginning. And I would have to say, if I remember correctly, um, what, what, when was it exactly? I believe it might have been the 1960s where everyone's experience was drastically different. People started coming forward with stories of alien contact that were much different from the happy go lucky spiritual encounters. These were darker and nefarious stories that came out around that time. Right. I, people have this idea that aliens are coming to save humans. No, there are no aliens coming to save humans. There are no aliens who want to save humans. Humans are looked at as, uh, in, well, in a very negative light by every other extraterrestrial race out there. Now, they are uh, extraterrestrial groups out there who wish to salvage certain individuals who are RH negative or who are hybridized because they see them as being of value. Uh, again, which particular civilization would be most interested is, is one which would be aligned with what your genetic profile is. So someone who is, let's say, uh, more of a reptilian would probably be attractive to the reptilian COCAR empire, whereas someone who is more, let's say, humanoid may be more attractive to the Galactic Federation. So there's also the issue of whether an individual can be integrated into these uh, civilizations because these civilizations don't operate like a human civilization. So if you look at this planet, this is the only planet anywhere probably in the universe where you have all these different countries claiming sovereignty. Every other planet out there is a one world planet with a one world government and nobody is electing leaders. There's no democracy. It is a leadership based on uh, competence and uh, qualification. And this is how you make sure that a civilization runs properly. You have people at the top who are qualified to run a civilization and not an actor who got elected by a bunch of people because he looked cool or he was over six feet tall and now he sits there and makes up some ridiculous policies. So this planet is sort of considered a joke as far as not only the level of technology, but the, the level of emotional and quote unquote spir spiritual maturity of the people who live here on the surface. You'll get no argument from me. Right. I'm, 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 I didn't think I would. <laughs> no, unfortunately, no. I mean, I would love to shoot something back at you, but I mean, that's pretty much it. Yeah. So no one's coming to save humans. No. Uh, everyone is basically saying good riddance. We're pretty and, much uh, alone in, in the universe in that regard. I mean, we're kind of left to our own uh, sort of anchor here. In a certain ironic way, when back in the day, uh, quote unquote, authority figures would say we're all alone in the universe in a certain way. They're right because nobody really wants us. So I uh, wonder why. Yeah, they, they want the resources of the planet. Definitely. It's a it's a great planet due to its location and, and the resources it has. But they certainly don't want the inhabitants on the who are on the surface of the planet. They, they don't even the the, in, the, peep, the extraterrestrial groups who live on inside the planet won't even let humans into the inner earth. That's why you have these Arctic, Antarctic treaties and things like this where nations agree never to go down there and just to leave the place alone because they don't want any, any human beings around there. And let me ask you this really quickly. Some people say pedophilia comes from the reptilians. No. <laughs> no, again, this is an example of the, the David Icke mentality where everything gets blamed on on reptilians and it's 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 rather ridiculous uh that's what a lot of people yeah. believe though uh, people people believe all kinds and it of might, stuff they and believe it might the come, earth is flat i mean right, like, what right. am i gonna say about that i mean it might come from david ike though that that sort of uh, sort of connection there well it probably because david ike likes to tell stories about how uh reptilians are uh taking children and and scaring them in order to uh extract their adrenaline and turn it into adrenochrome and all these sort of uh, stories. But uh, the reptilian Siokar empire is certainly not interested in, in pedophilia or, or anything like this. And uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's human beings who are engaging in pedophilia. 
And uh, while human beings may have a certain amount of their free will compromised, uh, they, they're still responsible for their actions. Right. And no one forces human beings to go to war, yet they continuously go to war as if they never learned the lessons from the past wars or as if the war films that they watch that Hollywood makes don't discourage them or give them the thought that, hey, this is probably a bad idea. People will still go to war. People will still engage in pedophilia or whatever. And to blame that on on reptilians or greys or extraterrestrials is just it's like saying the devil made me do it. Right. No, I, the devil doesn't yes. make you go molest children. You do that on your own on your own yes <laughs> right right so but yeah so that that's certainly certainly not accurate and it's not to say that the elite don't engage in the trafficking of children there's certainly plenty of evidence the fbi's own crime statistics will say that something like thirty thousand children are trafficked across the border into the united states from mexico and these are these are facts but certainly uh the government is is uh not a. uh responsible for um you know that that going on and neither are our extraterrestrials it's the humans who traffic each other and, and do that sort of thing right of course with that being sure. said humans are being abducted and they're used in, in medical experiments and this sort of thing by the greys and the anunnaki and that definitely does go on those four million plus people who've gone missing they're not going missing f for no reason but I, I think the topic of pedophilia is a very hot button salacious topic like uh, talking about tr trans individuals on beer cans it's a hot button topic. it's a very hot topic sure yeah, but it really is nothing to do with with reality and uh the reality that human beings are facing is one of extermination, regardless of whether they're pedophiles or not. They're all going to end up in FEMA camps or uh, dead in a nuclear holocaust. And I think this is probably a good time to talk about concentration camps and that sort of topic. And uh, I think the idea of death camps is a fourth vector that is used for reducing the population and keeping them under control. So a lot of people, they don't believe that there are camps like this. So I'd say that uh, there was an interview by Amy Raw with a political researcher named Craig Hewlett, and they published a, a number of white papers analyzing various social and political events. And uh, the subject of concentration camps came up under the George Bush administration. And uh, a Amy asked, um, Craig, what do you mean by work, camp, work camps? And his response to uh, this contention that work camps are already placed in public service, Mr. Hewlett replied, this isn't a myth. It's in the public law. It isn't a, sup a supposition. It isn't the left wing or a conspiracy theory. It is a fact of our own public administration. And so the, the interview goes on and on and goes into great detail about how these sort of camps will be used. And at this point, the listeners to the show should realize that there are over 1,000 concentration camps capable of holding 30 million people in the United States and in North America. And actually, as of 2012, over 30 foreign military bases under the UN flag are operating inside the United States. And I want the audience to really let this sink in because it's Nazi Germany all over again. It's the last harvest is really the last Holocaust. It's not a Jewish Holocaust this time, but rather a human Holocaust. And I, I bring this up because a lot of people wonder where all the Nazis went after World War II. And the answer is that most of them came to America and founded many of our institutions, such as NASA and the CIA. Right. So Werner von Braun was certainly not the only rocket scientist who was brought over to this country. As a matter of fact, when Alan Dulles took Reinhard Gellin, who was a high-ranking Nazi, to the United States, he took him into partnership in order to transform the Office of Strategic Services into the Central Intelligence Agency. And by doing so, he really set the stage for a future Holocaust in this country. Because with so many Nazis influencing our political culture and military industrial complex, would it surprise anyone to know that this country now has concentration camps? No. Would it surprise them to know that these concentration camps are fed by repurposed trains and even gas chambers? It certainly doesn't surprise me. 
just like it's not a shock that the U.S. military is creating super soldiers through the administration of drugs, yet there's a drug war for you. So why do we persecute citizens for drug use but endorse and even mandate it in soldiers? And where do these practices come from? Originally from the Nazis. So it really should be no shock to find that the proverbial chicken has come home to roost <laughs> as Nazi ideology was crafted in the United States to begin with and then exported to Germany. So it only makes sense that we brought it back here in time. And for those who listen to this and say, what are you talking about? Railway trains to gas chambers. What is this nonsense? OK, well, check this out. On August 6th of 1994, there was an insider by the name of Phil Schneider who toured an Amtrak rail car repair facility at Beach Grove, Indianapolis, Indiana. And there were at least 10 maintenance barns in this facility covering about 129 acres, along with two separate fences with the tops leaning inward to prevent an escape. And the windows of several of these buildings had been bricked up. So you had three levels of security for an Amtrak repair barn. They were helicopter, 25 knot aviation wind socks. Um, they were high security NSA style turnstiles for people and high intense security lighting that ran 24 hours. So the boxcar building had fence that was marked with special CIA red blue zone signs. And these correspond to the mission of what are called the red and blue lists, which surfaced in June and July of 1996, two days, two years later. So under martial law, this would become a death camp, for example, because they would handle category one and two, which are red and blue people there. And then the boxcar facility would be used for executions. So one of the barns was large enough to put four boxcars into, and they were powered vents on the top of the barn to keep gas in so they could vent it after the boxcars would be fumigated. And they were buildings all had newly installed six inch gas pipes and furnaces in the railroad barns. And FEMA had allocated six million to make the walls and roofs of the buildings airtight. So under martial law, this facility could easily be immediately uh, converted into an SS style termination camp. So actually, on January 27th of 1995, the Indianapolis News ran an article entitled Amtrak lays off 212 at Beach Grove. 170 lose jobs at the maintenance center today. So why would you perform $6 million worth of renovations and then lay off 212 people? Oh, weird. And what's interesting is Phil Schneider also related, this is the same insider, that Gunderson Steel Fabrication, who manufactures railroad cars, had secured a federal contract to build 107,200 full-length railroad cars, each equipped with 143 pairs of shackles. This project was so large, it required 11 subcontractors, including Bethlehem Steel. Schneider confirmed that he had seen one of the cars in the rail yards in North Portland and calculated the numbers. If you multiply 107,200 times 143 times 11, you come up with about 15 million people that could be transported to death camps in these trains. Yes, it's pretty, so, pretty wild. His story is pretty pretty awesome actually you know in my opinion he would go on to say that there's a 1477 underground bases um around the united states right and and a lot of people would would listen to this i know and they'd say oh this is some insider he must have been uh, maybe he smoked a little too much reefer or something like that but what people don't realize here is that all presidents since johnson have signed a series of executive orders upon leaving office each one building upon the other to bring us to a current state where we have legal and lawful totalitarianism at the flip of a switch. And there could be nothing more than the declaration of a state of emergency, and they're almost ready. They can declare a state of emergency over anything and activate this entire system. So it could be a nuclear strike on New York City or any American city. It could be another and more destructive pandemic like a COVID 2025. That uh, It could be a race war, a financial collapse, a staged alien invasion. Not that we need to stage it, but we could. Uh, a catastrophic climate change, worldwide crop failure. Any of these events are a pretext to declare a state of emergency, implement martial law, and confiscate everything you own, including your physical body and deposit you in either a concentration camp or a death camp. And for those who say, well, how can they do this? 
It's the law, but how many of you know that? And I, I know that a lot of people may still think that I'm making this up, so I can name for you some executive orders to help wake people up. So, for example, um, we have Executive Order 10995, which talk about all communications being able to be seized by the federal government, uh, seizure of electrical power, fuels, gasoline, all food and resources, farms and equipment, all transportation, including your personal car, seizure of all civilians for work under federal supervision, uh, federal takeover of all health, education, and welfare. The Postmaster General can become empowered to register every man, woman, and child in the USA. We have seizure of all aircraft and airports by the federal government. It goes on and on and on. And that I can read them off. It's Executive Order 10995, 10997, 998, 999. It goes all the way up to Executive Order 11051. And a lot of people don't know that in 2021, there was a National Defense Authorization Act that declared the USA a de facto battleground and allows for, get it, the legal assassination of anyone. It also allows for the power to seize anything and everything, including you and your family, as well as your assets. So these are just a few actual verifiable executive orders that have been put in place to get us started on our path to both enslavement and genocide. And if you think back to 9-11, before 9-11 happened, there were individuals who purchased large amounts of puts on oh, the stock yeah. market You're and right. made a fortune off the tragedy of 9-11. Lots of insider trading. Yeah. Now, can you imagine what would happen if there was, let's say, a nuclear strike in New York City? The market crashed and these individuals had shorted the market in advance and then they declare a state of emergency, martial law, activate all these executive orders and the elite confiscate literally all the wealth in the United States in one shot. It all becomes theirs. I mean, and it's all legal and lawful and people have been sitting around while these laws and executive orders have been passed. And they don't even know, or if they do, they don't care. They think, oh, that's nonsense. That's so 1990s. It's so early 2000s. No one cares about that anymore. But these laws are there. They can do it. And what would stop them? Yeah, they're the there, only, and they've been outlined already. Right. The only thing that would stop them is that the elite would not be ready yet to do it. But they're getting closer and closer to being ready. 2025 is right around the corner. It's right around the corner, and I'll give you a break here so... You could uh, catch your breath here. You don't have to talk. I'm going to play this <laughs> audio here for you, my friend. It's one that we were discussing here about NYC. So there's been a nuclear attack. Don't ask me how or why. Just know that the big one has hit. Okay? So what do we do? There are three important steps that I want you to remember. Step one, get inside fast. You, your friends, your family, get inside. And no, staying in the car is not an option. You need to get into a building and move away from the windows. Step two, stay inside. Shut all doors and windows. Have a basement? Head there. If you don't have one, get as far into the middle of the building as possible. If you were outside after the blast, Get clean immediately. Remove and bag all outer clothing to keep radioactive dust or ash away from your body. Step three, stay tuned. Follow media for more information. Don't forget to sign up for Notify NYC for official alerts and updates. Yeah, sign up. And for don't the, go outside uh, until officials say it's safe. Sign up for the FEMA right. camp. You've got this. <laughs> Coming to a neighborhood near you. Very interesting uh, choice of commercial here by NYC, yes. um, their health department. Right, and they were they were running this, I believe, in subways as well. Uh, I had actually left New York City before that campaign was launched, but I saw it online, and I, I find it also very entertaining that people think they can survive a. A, a nuclear strike by going into right. the center of the building. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, that's it's, silly. It's 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 no sillier than telling people to wear a mask, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's definitely up there in, in terms of silliness. But uh, they're planning they're planning something. They're they're planning a lot, and again, I I I really like to to harp on these 
these facts and these figures because when people hear about the last harvest, they sometimes go, oh, aliens and yeah, it's all the, bullshit. The, yeah, it's all nonsense. And they think like you can't prove this. Yeah. But I can prove everything else that really matters and is really relevant <laughs> to people because it doesn't matter if the if the people in general don't believe in extraterrestrials. The important thing is that the elite who are planning your genocide, they believe in extraterrestrials. Oh, they it's believe actually it. not a belief for them. They know. They, they interact with them. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter what you believe. You can argue if it's real or not while you're sitting in a FEMA camp waiting to die. I mean, it's it's a, it's a, a possible Yeah, there, it's no mystery. Future. It's no mystery why billionaires have been rushing to all these fancy underground bunkers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I talked to an, an individual who runs one of these businesses and Business couldn't get any better for that guy. I no. mean, he's a wealthy man right now, beyond wealthy, and all of his clients are ultra elite. They all have these completely, um, these extremely, I was going to say, expensive and sophisticated sort of um, underground bunkers they have. It's just extraordinary. Yes. And they are well aware of what's going to come. And some of them big into uh, Planet X as well. Yeah, Planet X is actually uh, known as Nibiru. Or Nibiru, yes. Right. And uh, The Last Harvest talks about that planet in quite some detail. It is actually not a planet. It is a, a spherical battleship. And it is an Anunnaki spacecraft. So it's not on its way. It's actually here. You just can't see it because it's cloaked. And the Anunnaki is another uh, extraterrestrial group that is looking at this planet and would like to take it for themselves as well. So we have several alien civilizations that are actually circling this planet right now with, with warships, but people can't detect them because of the technology. And they're all waiting. It's like a Mexican standoff. You see, we're no threat to them, but they're a threat to each other. So no one really wants to be the first one to to start shooting or doing something. So they're sort of sitting around and waiting and seeing what's going to happen. But they all know what the ultimate outcome will be already, which is that the planet will be destroyed because of artificial intelligence. So it's just a question of sitting around, waiting for it to get to that point, and then just taking out the planet. Of course, if they can take out the problem without destroying the planet itself, that would be optimal because then they could enjoy the planet. But the way it's looking, it's the whole planet is just going to be destroyed. And to create a new planet is not a big deal. The, the technology for creating planets and moving them about, this is, uh, it's, it's not uncommon. Uh, I, I know when people hear this, they, they say, oh, what is this person watch too many science fiction films or something? But let me give people a frame of reference so they can really understand just how disadvantaged human beings are from a technological point of view. If you, let's say, had a magical Doctor, to, Doctor Who time machine and you went back in time to, let's say, the Middle Ages, which is only, what, a few hundred years, uh, and you had an iPhone with you, and you showed it to some peasant somewhere, they would think this is the most, they couldn't even conceive what you're showing them. Sorcery. And sorcery, they'd say, witchcraft. And this tech, that would only be a couple hundred years of technology. Now, you have to understand that various alien civilizations, for example, the reptilian Siakar Empire, their technology is over 100 million years more advanced than ours. So... The things are possible out there that we couldn't even comprehend. This idea you see in Hollywood films of aliens landing with advanced technology and a couple of patriotic Americans with their AR-15s taking them out and driving them home. This is just human fantasy and delusion at its finest. Uh, an alien civilization like the Anunnaki, for example, or the Wolfen, which genetically en engineered the Anunnaki, they could send a small contingent onto this planet and take the planet in one day. It's not even, it's a joke for them. So human beings have no chance and they just can't comprehend what the level of technology is that these aliens have. So when I say that planet X is already here in orbit waiting and people think I'm making it up. No, it's 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 this is this is kid stuff. So I, I just wanted to to bring that out. No worries. Yes, Planet yeah. X has been being talked a lot about, and some say it's a brown dwarf star. You say it's a actual ship. 
Yes, it's a it's a, a spherical Warcraft, and the spherical Warcrafts have been around for a while. The the Death Star that's in Star Wars is actually taken from ancient history because the reptilian Siakar Empire used battlecraft like that, and they were indeed capable of wiping out planets. So when you hear about the eye in the sky, or you see this you know, on the back of the dollar bill, this idea of an eye in the sky and that kind of thing, this actually goes back to at one point in the Earth's history, you could look up and see what would be a Death Star looking down on the planet, because that's uh, these that's one of the vehicles that's used when planets are colonized is they travel in craft that is that large because it would contain all the mining and tunneling enginery that are used to hollow out planets and extract resources. You can't put that on a little ship. It needs to be a planet or a planetoid sized ship. And uh, so the, the Anunnaki have their battlecraft of that nature as well. And uh, yeah, all this, all these things actually do exist. So a lot of what you see in science fiction is, not pulled from from nowhere it, it comes from somewhere these ideas even if the writers don't know where they're necessarily getting the ideas from they may say well i made it up or i'm being very creative but it's really more that their mind tapped into some sort into of something yeah. it's almost like they're channel channeling something yes they're just not always aware of it right. they, they may say well i said i smoke a joint and just come up with this stuff okay well it just so happens that those things you came up with actually did occur and the last harvest goes into these uh this backstory in great detail because currently all the information about the history of the galaxy has been pulled for from basically one source which was that there was a uh, an alien pilot who uh was his craft crashed on an indian reservation some time ago and he survived and he had a crystalline computer more like a hard drive on his computer that can uh that contained a lot of information and he told this Indian tribe about this information. Some of it got published and then it gets regurgitated over and over in different right. That's, forms. It's kind of, again, I, you know, I hate to hark back to it, but the Galactic Federation of Light and the whole origins of that, you know, it, it also kind of reminded me of almost like Scientology in a way. Right. There's some correlation there. Yeah. I'm, I'm not familiar with Scientology. So I, I, couldn't really comment on it, but uh, again, many, how should I say, not only science, and L. Ron Hubbard was originally a science fiction writer, right, if I'm not right. mistaken. They, they're, they, they get this information from somewhere. They're George pulling Lucas from somewhere, was yeah. an insider. A lot of uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien were members of secret societies, and no doubt that this influenced a lot of their quote-unquote creative works, which were I believe maybe it. telling a little more than the normal yeah just look at uh, hp lovecraft as well right right uh, that's um it's a great example there yeah yeah and, and if someone thinks I'm, I'm i'm getting too far into the the alien topic i let's get back to something a little i don't bit. Really, i don't really think you are though to, oh, you to don't be think honest so? no okay. i i think you're perfectly in line of, of what's going <laughs> on here i mean all these sort of things all tie together mm -hmm. and that's why i really want to read this book um i'm Definitely got to buy it. You know, The Last Harvest, for those that are wondering, yes, go to Amazon.com, search The Last Harvest, you'll find the book, Lucian Mars. Look it up. And no, we're not talking to Lucian Mars right now. We're talking to uh, Damien, Damien Dumar. Yes. Just, just in case someone forgets, you know, I got to let them know here. And again, um, Damien, a, a lot of what we're talking about it aligns with a lot of things that we've discussed here on this program for years now, since 2012. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been talking about a lot of these sort of things, but going back to uh, Planet X, you know, I've, I was always told and read that the massive gravitational pull would cause earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and tsunamis, and it, it would be wiping out entire cities, leaving, leaving uh, millions dead or injured. And uh, it would disturb the magnetic field, basically, and cause widespread power outages. And you're saying that this is a ship. Yes. And I'm asking or wondering, will all these sort of things still happen? Well, there's really, there's really no need for uh, those other things to happen. Uh, in order for the New World Order to pull off their agenda. True. There certainly were periods in Earth's history where there were pole shifts and yeah. life was wiped out and recreated. The, the history of the planet is 
very old and it's it's a very long and detailed story so there have been periods of time where whatever was on the surface was wiped out and things started anew but now we're at a at a critical juncture where it's not a question of wiping it out and starting anew it's about wiping it out in totality and do you yourself have any sort of um, personal experiences with lights in the sky or anything in the realm of the paranormal per se Sure, sure, I have endless experiences about that, but it's not something I, I normally go into because it's sort of it, it goes a bit into the realm of entertainment and and it's it's again they're they're not they're they're personal a- anecdotal stories. But something, she, yeah. But you've experienced something yourself. Oh, many, many okay. things. I I was I am an RH. Not only am I RH negative, I am an alien reptilian hybrid. So you bet I've had a lot of things. Experiences. Okay. Yeah, I just don't go into them because people will tend to dismiss it as yeah. as nonsense. I I rather talk about, for example, the 1986 Immigration Control Act and and. Things no, I which understand. Are, yeah, more more pressing because people then take it seriously. Otherwise, they just go, oh, how entertaining. Okay, well, He's look, I, I'll do this. Again. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Then I'll, I'll do this right here. Have you considered alternative explanations or viewpoints while uncovering the secret history here? Like, how do you evaluate the validity of these competing theories or interpretations? And what led you to reject or favor certain perspectives? See, when I word it like that, you know, now people can't really bitch. <laughs> well, I, I, I think when it comes to how do I personally evaluate? Yeah, how do you vet these things? Well, a, a lot of it is is based, of course, on on my ex- personal experiences. Wh- when for how somebody else can can validate what's in the book. Well, the the reality is that when it comes to the topics of alien civilizations, nobody is able to really vet or prove this one way or the other because up until the last harvest was written, none of this information was available. So all we had is is books about the Galactic Federation or David Icke talking about reptilians and how would anyone vent, vent any of that stuff? And and that's part of the problem. But uh, so that's why the, the most important part of the book is not exactly – those details it's it's what's most important about the book is that which is verifiable which is that there is this plan to exterminate 90 percent of the population and that this plan is ultimately being pushed by an extraterrestrial influence and while i can't directly prove that extraterrestrials exist there are plenty of quotes like i read earlier that show that the united states government knows for very sure that aliens exist And the Catholic Church knows they exist. And the scientific community that are insiders know that it exists. So all the nitty gritty details about whether whether it's true that the Anunnaki are are, are piloting Planet X as a spaceship, that I could never prove whether that's uh, true or not. Neither could anybody else. But it's not really important. But what's important is what can be proven, which is that by 2025 they are going to embark on a plan of genocide and no one will survive that is what is important to understand and that is what is provable because the amount of evidence in this book that's presented in direct quotes again it's not lucy and mars making this up it's not me coming up with a story this is based on verifiable documentation and the book has footnotes and quotes and someone who doubts anything that's in the book that's related to that top those topics can easily look them up but as far as uh on again me personally yes, sir. i i have my personal uh, experience which is extensive with sure, sure. E- extraterrestrials that i know what is legit and what isn't but I can't necessarily transfer that experience to someone who reads the book. They're on their own in that regard. (laughs) However, I will point this out that many people who have been abducted by aliens or or who are hybridized on some level, whether they're aware of it or not, they will find that a lot of what's in the book resonates with them. And they will certainly find that what is told in this book all makes sense and adds up and connects everything that anyone has ever heard before that all that everything finally makes sense so people for example would would say oh well how does the existence of extraterrestrials and aliens coexist with this idea of angels and satan well when you find out that 
uh, Satan was not only a fallen angel, but he is a uh, alpha draconian reptilian, then suddenly the ideas that normally look like they're at odds with one another, they coalesce. So uh, another example, which is in the book, The Last Harvest, is uh, when people in the Bible will talk about Yahweh. Well, who was Yahweh? Well, Yahweh was actually the wolf and Anunnaki prince named Enlil, and he liked to masquerade or as an imposter and try to pretend he was the divine father. So he would call himself Yahweh, and from the individuals who lived on this planet, when you see a being come down from the sky in a spaceship who has incredible technology and who created or help to create you, you are going to tend to view that individual as a god, although he is not the divine father, he's not the creator, he is just a very advanced genetic engineer. So he calls himself Yahweh. So then in the Bible, you will see people talk about Yahweh, and they'll equate Yahweh with God, and they'll say, okay, well, how do these things uh, coexist at the same time? Because they're really one and the same. That's true. And you know, that's a hell of an answer, uh, Damien. You know, I just had to get you fired up for that one. And uh, you, did, you did a great job, by the way. That was a hell of an answer. And again, I, I can't really disagree with you on that. Right. And, and I think that one of the many reasons why people should read The Last Harvest is because it, it, it lends the sort of clarity to those who are willing to read it. And I know that the book is very dark and people are used to Hollywood type happy endings. And this book does not have We a like happy dark ending. here, by the way. Oh, well, that's great. That's probably why I'm I'm so well received on this show. That's right. But I, I think a lot of people will read the book and they have trouble getting through it at certain points because it really is triggering them and resonating with something that they know on some level is true. And they read it and they say, well, this can't be made up, not only because it's so full of quotes, but even that which is not backed by quotes, such as the history of the galaxy, it makes sense, unlike anything else that's ever been told before. So I, I think this makes the book very full and impactful and I, I very noteworthy, I, yes. And I encourage anyone to download the Kindle version or get the audiobook or even get the paperback with its beautiful cover. You can put it on your shelf and when people come to your house to visit, they say, What are you reading lately? I'm reading this. <laughs> nice, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm looking at the ratings right now and they're pretty good. 61 percent all five stars by the way wow that's great it's pretty I, high I thank everyone there. for those wonderful reviews yes there, there's only one one star review that that's fine it tends to be in alignment with the 80 20 rule which i expect by kathy moses who says one star ridiculous yeah, I mean, there's, I, I am completely not surprised that a certain percentage of the population will hear me speak and say this is absolutely ridiculous. And that's fine with me because my mission is not to convince anyone of the veracity of what I am saying. My mission is to get this information out in front of as many people as possible because that's what the divine father wants agreed don't waste your time or money very far-fetched ideas to me kathy who um put this review on amazon i i think a lot of what was relayed here in this book completely went over her head uh probably because she's never looked into any of these things that are discussed in this book I think a, a lot of people who leave those sort of reviews may not have even read the book. Either that or, either that or they just couldn't understand any of it. Again, it, right. it's a lack of it's a, it's just out of ignorance really. Yeah, I, I don't I don't see how anyone could read the book from cover to cover and make a statement like that because as I've pointed out consistently, half the book is actual quotes and government documents so how can someone say that these are far-fetched right, ideas right, right how can they say uh that this is a, a bunch of ridiculous nonsense i mean there is actually a book available on amazon and it is a u.s military manual that goes into great detail about how concentration camps are going to be run and you can get this book on Amazon. It is a U.S. government book. And we quote from this uh, book extensively in, in The Last Harvest. And uh, I the, certainly the United States did not publish that document for giggles. 
or because they thought it was funny. It's because <laughs> yes. it's, it's an actual book. So, uh, for example, I, if, in, in January 14th of 2005, the U.S. Army published a rapid action revision plan called Army Regulation 210-35, commonly known as the Civilian Inmate Labor Program. And Army Chief of Staff General P. Uh, Peter J. Schumacher stated at the time, quote, this regulation provides guidance for establishing and managing civilian inmate labor programs on Army installations, end quote. Now, does that sound like a far-fetched idea, a ridiculous idea, something I made up? Does it sound like it would be a waste of money to learn more about what they have planned for you? The, if you note the wording, this is not a prison labor program, a civilian labor program. So I, I can only say if someone leaves a review like this or makes a comment like this in the chat, they haven't read the book because this is not made up. It's not the words of Lucian. It's not my fantasy. This is actually a document that you can confirm and look up and you can find out that this is true. And The Last Harvest is filled with these sorts of gems. And has there been any backlash yet to any of this material? Well, I can say that the elite and the various extraterrestrial groups that are conspiring they are not happy at all with the fact this book is gaining the fact that this book is getting gaining the traction that it's gaining oh yes it is gaining traction yeah they are not happy at all <laughs> yes th this book actually was mentioned to me by uh, a number of people actually yeah the, that's and and some of the stuff that's in the book is is even news to the elite who are working for the nebu gray empire they're not even aware of some of the stuff. And now they read this book and they go, oh, my, <laughs> it's not like we thought it was. Because a lot of the elite, they think they're going to go to escape and go to Mars and be on a base on Mars and that sort of thing. And no, they just they won't need them anymore. Once they've done the job of getting rid of 90 percent of the population, they'll be killed off, too. Well, again, I hope to be around to see this sort of a light show in the sky. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to get it though, to be honest. I, I feel like I wouldn't be important enough to be there. Well, listen, you may get your wish. You might not see a light you, show um... in the sky. You might see the blinding flash of a nuclear explosion, but <laughs> yeah. you'll have to settle for that. I guess you're right. I will see something, but um, I won't be safe when it happens, uh, sadly. Well, if, uh, a nuclear explosion, it's over very quick. You just get vaporized. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Uh, what's, what's more alarming is being in a concentration camp for a long period of time, because as you can probably imagine, there won't be any PlayStations in there. That's right. Uh, no, not with all those, uh, barbed wire and gun towers. And, and what about those endless plastic coffins that FEMA spent their money on? Oh yeah. Remember that? It's, yeah. They're, they're, they're still there. Those are not biodegradable. So those coffins still exist. They're even somewhere, right? Nobody's talking about it. It's, uh. It's it's really rather alarming. And what's funny is that whenever there is an actual disaster, FEMA always proves to be utterly useless despite billions <laughs> right. of dollars in funding. So they can afford to have thousands of plastic coffins and buy billions of rounds of ammunition but can't provide basic food and medical supplies during a flood. It, it's it's ridiculous. Uh, what, do you, what do they plan to do with two billion rounds of ammunition? Who will they be shooting at? Well, probably you. Right. Yeah, probably me. And the craziest thing is you all paid for it with your tax dollars. Yeah, it's the craziest and most it's screwed so up funny. part. Yeah, it's it's um, pretty ridiculous, really. And I believe the book also goes into the Montauk Project. Uh, the, the, the book doesn't mention the Montauk Project. I, I think probably where you've heard that is that I have mentioned in previous podcasts that I am a product of the Montauk. Right. Project. There we go. Yes. Right. You but yourself. The, the book does not cover the, the, the Montauk project. It, it covers the general idea of hybridization of human beings. And the Montauk project was primarily a hybridization program that was run by uh, the Anunnaki and, and others. Right. We've talked about that on the program uh, many, many moons ago as well. Yes. Always interesting to hear about that, though. And of course, the book, The Last Harvest, definitely go pick that up, boys and girls. Go to Amazon.com. Easiest way to go. In my opinion, yes, Amazon.com. You know, I, I don't really like the website that much, but it's probably the simplest way for people to go get the book. I should also point out that the uh, 
not only the ebook but the audiobook is available on all platforms, including Spotify. Anywhere there's a platform for audiobooks and ebooks, The Last Harvest is there. And the book is currently being well, actually we just finished translating it into Spanish. It's going to go into publication probably within the month. And the next uh, we're going to be translating it into Japanese. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Once once the book needs to be translated, that means it's a success. Yeah, well, the idea, again, is to get it in front of as many people as pops possible. And Spanish is uh, one of the largest, uh, uh, most commonly spoken languages, along with English. And, uh, of course, Chinese is also very, uh, very billions of people speak that language. Right. But I don't think the Chinese government would be very keen Probably on this not. book in Chinese. <laughs> and yeah. uh, the Japanese seem to be so interested in these type of topics. So I figure to get it into the Asia market... Japan is a good a good language to translate it into. Absolutely. Once again, Damien, I do want to thank you for being a part of the program. And if there's something you feel that you didn't get a chance to bring up or discuss here, mm. definitely feel free to do so right now. Anything on your mind or anything pertaining to the book or anything at all, go ahead. The stage is yours, my friend. Well, I guess in conclusion, I would like to reiterate again that this book isn't a prophecy, it's a plan, and you need to listen to what Bill Gates is saying, what Henry Kissinger is saying. I mean, even beloved Jacques Cousteau wants to eliminate 350,000 people per day. So I, I do understand that a lot of uh, this sort of thing tends to get buried in the endless gossip and entertainment that streams through your web browser and cell phones, but the reality is you can't hang out on Instagram or TikTok when you're dead. So instead of <laughs> right. thinking about how you're going to be a top G or the next big influencer or taking pictures for Instagram, just think about the, the, the fact that uh, within the next 10 to 15 years, you'll probably be dead or behind barbed wire in a FEMA camp. And this isn't me saying it or Lucian saying it. This is the elite saying it. And you can hear it in their own words in the, in the pages of this book. So uh, I think that there's nothing that's – more important for a human being than to understand not only what's going to happen to them, but to understand the context and the history of why. Because many people, they go through life and they don't know where they came from, why they're here, who they create. It's all a mystery. And the last harvest finally um, pulls back the curtain on the mystery. And I think for that alone, those are enough reasons for anyone to want to read this book. There's never been a book written like this ever. It's completely unique. Everything you read in this book are things you've never heard before. And it'll all make sense. Very nice. Once again, always a honor and pleasure. Talk to you on the other side, my friend. Thank you. And there he goes, boys and girls. That was my guest, Damien Dumar. The book is called The Last Harvest, A Secret History of Lucifera, Aliens, the Illuminati, and the Fate of Humanity. That's The Last Harvest by Lucian Mars. Definitely go pick that up wherever you can. And boys and girls, that concludes tonight's broadcast. And I do want to thank all of you out there for pressing play. Those of you on YouTube, those of you on Patreon. And of course, those of you who just stumbled upon this. Much love and respect to every single one of you international listeners. Guten Morgen. I see you out there. Those of you outside of America, thank you so much for listening to the program. And of course, all of you out there in America, Canada, UK, Brazil, the Netherlands, Australia. I see you out there too. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you on the other side. And with that said, the world is a mysterious place and life itself is a mystery. Until next time. Mahalo. Things have changed and I have quit. Got nothing to look forward to. Put a backlash full of lies. You're too late where you're going. This is safe. The whistle's blowing. It's much too late. You're much too late. Like a piss hole. With his nose turned up And a fragrance on your own Tell me, tell me what it's like To be alone And let's not forget The scarface prick Ralph was fixed to your face He dropped out of the subhuman race And he said Boo-hoo
whistles blowing. It's much too late. It's much too late. You're much too late. You're much too late.